first of all, I mean, I'll probably do it in the introduction, but you're uh, one of the great robotics people at MIT. You're a professor at MIT. You teach a lot of amazing courses. You run a large group uh, and you have a important history for MIT, I think, as uh, being a part of the DARPA Robotics Challenge. Can you maybe first say, what is the DARPA Robotics Challenge? And then tell your story around it, your journey with it. Yeah, sure. Um, so the DARPA Robotics Challenge, it came on the tails of the DARPA Grand Challenge and DARPA Urban Challenge, which were the challenges that brought us, um, put a spotlight on self-driving cars. Um, Gil Pratt was at DARPA and pitched a new challenge that involved disaster response. Um, it didn't explicitly require humanoids, although humanoids came into the picture. This happened shortly after the Fukushima disaster in Japan, and our challenge was motivated roughly by that, because that was a case where if we had had robots that were ready to be sent in, there's a chance that we could have um, averted disaster. And certainly after the, um, in the disaster response, there were times where we would love, we would have loved to have sent robots in. So in practice, what we ended up with was a, a grand challenge, a DARPA robotics challenge, um, where Boston Dynamics was, uh, was to make humanoid robots. People like me and the, the amazing team at MIT, um, were competing first in a simulation challenge to try to be one of the ones that wins the right to work on one of the uh, the Boston Dynamics humanoids in order to compete in the the final challenge, which was a physical challenge. And at that point, it was already so it was decided as humanoid robots. Early so on. there were there were two tracks. There were, you could enter as a hardware team where you brought your own robot, or you could enter through the virtual robotics challenge as a software team that would try to win the right to use one of the Boston Dynamics robots. Which are called Atlas. Atlas. Humanoid robots. Yeah, yeah. it was a 400 pound marvel, but a you know pretty big, scary looking robot. Expensive too. Expensive at the yeah. time, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I mean, how did you feel at the prospect of this kind of challenge? I mean, it seems, you know, autonomous vehicles, yeah, I guess that sounds hard. But uh, not really from a robotics perspective. It's like, didn't they do it in the 80s? Is the kind of feeling I would have <laughs> uh, like when you first look at the problem and it's on wheels. But like humanoid robots, that sounds really hard. Uh, so what, like, how, uh, what, what are your, the, psychologically speaking, what were you feeling? Excited, scared? Why the heck did you get yourself involved in this kind of messy challenge? We didn't really know for sure what we were signing up for, um, in the sense that you could have had something that, as it was described in the call for participation, um, that could have put a huge emphasis on the dynamics of walking and not falling down and walking over rough terrain, or the same description, because the robot had to go into this disaster area and turn valves and and uh, pick up a drill, cut the hole through a wall. It had to do some interesting things. The challenge could have really highlighted perception and autonomous planning, or it, it ended up that you know locomoting over complex uh, terrain played a pretty big role in the competition. So. Uh, and the degree of autonomy wasn't clear. The degree of autonomy was always a central part of the discussion. So um, what wasn't clear was how we would be able, to, how far we'd be able to get with it. So the idea was always uh, that you want semi-autonomy, that you want the robot to have enough compute that you can have a degraded network link to a human. And so the same way you, we had degraded networks at, uh, at many natural disasters, you'd send your robot in you'd be able to get a few bits back and forth, but you don't get to have enough potentially to fully uh, operate the robot, every joint of the robot. So, and then the question was, and the gamesmanship of the organizers was to figure out what we're capable of, push us as far as we could, so that um, it would differentiate the teams that put more autonomy on the robot and had a few clicks and just said, go there, do this, go there, do this, versus someone who's picking every footstep or something like that. 
So what were some uh, memories, painful, triumphant from the experience? Like what was that journey? Maybe if you can dig in a little deeper, maybe even on the technical side, on the team side, that that whole process of um, from the early idea stages to actually competing. I mean, this stage. was a defining experience for me. I, it was, it came at the right time for me in my career. I had gotten tenure before I was due a sabbatical <laughs> and most people do something, you know, relaxing and restorative you, for a sabbatical. So you got tenure before the, the, before this. Yeah. 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 It was a good time for me. I had, I had, we had a bunch of algorithms that we were very happy with. We wanted to see how far we could push them. And this was a chance to really test our metal, to do more proper software engineering. Um, the team, we all just worked our butts off. We, you know, we're in that lab almost all the time. Um, okay, so there, I mean, there were some, of course, high highs and low lows throughout that. Uh, anytime you're, you know, not sleeping and devoting your life to a 400 pound humanoid. Um, I, I remember actually one funny moment where we're all super tired. And so Atlas had to walk across cinder blocks. That was one of the obstacles. And I remember Atlas was powered down and hanging limp, you know, on the, on its harness. And the, the humans were there like laying, you know, picking up and laying the brick down so that the robot could walk over it. And I thought, what is wrong with this? You know, <laughs> <laughs> we've got a robot just watching us do all the manual labor so that it can take its little, um, you know, <laughs> stroll across the terrain. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> I mean, even the, even the virtual robotics challenge was, was super nerve wracking and dramatic. I, I remember... Um, so, so we were using gazebo as a simulator, uh, on the cloud and there was all these interesting challenges. I think, um, the investment that, that OSR, um, FC, whatever they were called at that time, Brian Gerke's team at open source robotics, um, they were pushing on the capabilities of gazebo in order to scale it to the complexity of these challenges. So, um, you know, up to the virtual competition. So the virtual competition was you will sign on at a certain time and we'll have a network connection to another machine on the cloud that is running the simulator of your robot. And your controller will run on this comp this controller, this computer, and, and the physics will run on the other and you have to, to connect. Now, um, the physics, they wanted it to run at real-time rates because there was an element of human interaction um, and humans could, if you do want a teleop, it works way better if it's at frame rate. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. But it was very hard to simulate these compl these complex scenes at real time rate. So right up to like days before the competition, the the simulator wasn't quite uh, at real time rate, and that was great for me because my controller was solving a big, pretty big optimization problem, <laughs> and it wasn't quite at real time rate. So I was fine. I was keeping up with the simulator. We were both running at about 0.7. and I remember getting this email. And by the way, the perception folks on our team hated that, I, that they knew that if my controller was too slow, the robot was going to fall down. And, and you know, no matter how good their perception system was, if I can't make my controller fast. Enough. Anyways, we get this email like three days before the virtual competition. Well, you know, it's for all the marbles. We're going to either get a humanoid robot or we're not. Mm -hmm. And we get an email saying, good news. We made the robot, does the simulator faster. It's now <laughs> one point. And uh, I, we're... I was just like, oh man, what are we going to do here? So yeah. um, that came in late at night for me. Um, a few days ahead. A few days ahead. I went over, there was, it happened at Frank Permenter, who's a uh, very, very sharp. He's a, he was a student at the time um, working on optimization. Was He was still in lab. Uh, Frank, we need to make this quadratic <laughs> programming solver faster. Not like a little faster. It's actually, you know... Um, and we wrote a new solver for that QP together that night. <laughs> and you it was solver. terrifying. So there's a really hard optimization problem that you're constantly solving. You didn't make the optimization problem simpler. You you wrote a new solver. So um, I mean, your observation is almost spot on. What well, what we did was what everybody. I mean, people know how to do this, but we had not yet done this idea of warm starting. So we are solving a big optimization problem at every time step. But if you're running fast enough, the optimization problem you're solving on the last time step is pretty similar to the optimization you're going to solve at the next. Got it. We had, of course, had told our commercial solver to use warm starting, but even the interface 
to that commercial solver was causing us these delays. So what we did was we basically wrote, we called it fast QP at the time. Um, we wrote a very lightweight, very fast layer, which would basically check if nearby solutions to the quadratic program were, which were very easily checked, uh, could stabilize the robot. And if they couldn't, we would fall back to the solver. You couldn't really test this well, right? Um, or like, I mean, it, so we always knew that if we fell back to, if we, it got to the point where if for some reason things slowed down and we fell back to the original solver, the robot would actually literally fall down. Um, so it was, it was a harrowing sort of edge we were, ledge we were sort of on. But I mean, it, it actually like the, the 400 pound humanoid could come crashing to the ground if you, if you, if your solver's not fast enough. But you know, the, we had lots of good experiences. I, I'll, so can I ask you a, a, a weird question? I, I get um, about the idea of hard work. So um, actually people like students of yours that I've interacted with and just in robotics, people in general, but they, uh, they have moments at moments have worked harder than uh, most people I know in terms of if you look at different disciplines of how hard people work, but they're also like the happiest, <laughs> like, just like, I don't know. Um, it's the same thing with like running people that push themselves to like the limit. They all also seem to be like the most like full of life somehow. Uh, and I get often criticized, like, you don't, you're not getting enough sleep. What are you doing to your body? Blah, blah, blah. Like this kind of stuff. And I usually just kind of respond like, I'm I'm doing what I love. I'm passionate about. It. I, I love it. I feel like it's uh, it's invigorating. I actually think I don't think the lack of sleep is what hurts you. I think what hurts you is uh, stress and lack of doing things that you're passionate about. But in this world, yeah. I mean, can you comment about uh, why the heck robotics people are, are <laughs> uh, willing to push themselves to that degree? Is there value in that? And uh, why are they so happy? I think I think you got it right. I mean, I think the causality is not that we work hard, and I think other disciplines work very hard too. But it's I don't think it's that we work hard and therefore we are happy. I think we found something that we're truly passionate about. And it makes us very happy, and then we get a little involved with it and spend a lot of time on it. Um, what a luxury to have something that you want to spend all your time on, right? We could talk about this for many hours, but maybe if we could pick, is there something on the technical side on the approach that you took that's interesting that turned out to be a terrible failure or a, a success that you carry into your work today about all the different I ideas that were involved in um, making, whether in the in the simulation or in the in the real world, making this semi-autonomous system work. I mean, it really did teach me something fundamental about what it's gonna take to get robustness out of a system of this complexity. I would say the DARPA challenge really um, was foundational in my thinking. I think the autonomous driving community thinks about this. I think lots of people thinking about safety critical systems that might have machine learning in the loop are thinking about these questions. For me, the DARPA challenge was the moment where I realized, you know, we've spent every waking minute running this robot. And again, the, in for the physical competition, days before the competition, we saw the robot fall down in a way it had never fallen down before. I thought, you know, how could we have found that? You know, we only have one robot. It's running almost all the time. We just didn't have enough hours in the day to test that robot. Something has to change, right? And, and I think that, I mean, I would say that the team that won uh, was, was from KAIST was the team that had two robots and was able to do not only incredible engineering, just absolutely top rate engineering, but also they were able to test at a rate and um, discipline that we didn't keep up with. What does testing look like? What are we talking about here? Like what's what's a, a loop of test, like a from start to finish, what does a loop of testing look yeah, like? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a whole philosophy to testing. There's the unit tests and you can do that on a hardware, you can do that in a, a small piece of code. You write one function, you should write a test that, that checks that function's input and outputs. 
You should also write an integration test at the other extreme of of running the whole system together. You know, where that that try to turn on all of the different functions that you you think are correct. It's much harder to write the specifications for a system level test, especially if that system is as complicated as a humanoid robot. But the philosophy is sort of the same. On the real robot, um, it's it's no different. But on a real robot, it's impossible to run the same experiment twice. So if you if you see a failure, you hope you caught something in the logs that tell you what happened, but you'd probably never be able to run exactly that experiment again. And right now, I think our philosophy is just basically Monte Carlo uh, estimation, is just uh, run as many experiments as we can, maybe try to set up the environment to, uh, to make the things we are worried about happen as often as possible. But really, we're relying on somewhat random search in order to test. Maybe that's all we'll ever be able to. But I think, uh, you know, because there's an argument that the things that'll get you are the, the the things that are really nuanced in the world. And it'd be very hard to, for instance, put back in a simulation.